Hi, everyone. Hello again. Still May 10, 2021. Do you remember this? We are engaged in an information war. You know, during the Cold War, we did a great job in getting America's message out. After the Berlin Wall fell, we said, okay, fine, enough of that. You know, we've done it, we're done. Um, and unfortunately, we are paying a big price for it. And our, our private media cannot fill that gap. In fact, our private media, particularly cultural programming, often works at counter purposes to what we truly are as Americans and what our values are. I remember having an Afghan general tell me that uh, the only thing he thought about Americans is that all the men wrestled and the women walked around in bikinis because the only TV he ever saw was Baywatch and worldwide wrestling. So. <laughs> we, we are in an information war, and we are losing that war. I'll be very blunt in my assessment. Al Jazeera is winning. The Chinese have opened up a global English language and multi-language television network. The Russians have opened up an English language network. I've seen it in a few countries, and it's quite uh, instructive. Do you agree with Secretary Clinton? She is actually saying, we are losing the propaganda war. We need more propaganda getting out to the world. And Hillary, I just want to say, your values and my values, very different. So don't say American values, especially when you're Hillary Clinton. Okay, the information war has only ramped up and the war is right here. That screen you were looking at watching this video, that's where the war is. But just like mommy, we've got the daughter. Can I say daughter anymore? I don't think so. Um, didn't they ex, you know, daughter, son, mother, father. Congress did, actually. That was the first bill that they um, started with when Congress got back in session in January to X, X out all references to gender. Gender, sorry. When I get tired, my New York comes out. Um, Chelsea Clinton calls for global crackdown on anti-vax social media posts. Wow, speaking at a Vatican organized conference meant to promote open dialogue, let's close it all down, according to, yeah, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, as they say. Anybody who calls for the silencing of experts and doctors and just ordinary people who actually have done the research and know, well, that's unfortunate. Um, and if anybody can look at this woman and her mother and think that these are good people, you need to really, I don't know, do some research or reevaluate your view your view of, of these people and a whole lot like them. Now, in the last video that I posted, I posted this article. 2011 CBS News social media is a tool of the CIA. Seriously. And yeah, it's very serious. But in 2011, you know, mainstream media has come out, come out with enough, enough truth for the American people to be alarmed. All right. I am not going to get into this document, social media as a tool of hybrid warfare, NATO. This is NATO. Social media as a tool of hybrid warfare. NATO Stratcom. Now, I've, 
I've been wanting to do a video on this. I have many captures from that document. It's long. Um, let me just show you. Because I'm, I will be doing a video focusing on this uh, social media as a tool for hybrid warfare because everything that we're experiencing here, as you're looking at that screen in the cyber world, it may not be real. A whole lot is not real. But this, the deer process, this is a capture from that document. Dissemination of public propaganda. Deletion or suspension of accounts by adversaries. Evolution of network structure or methods. Expansion of influence or methods. Replenishment of accounts and resources. And they also go into the trolls, the particular uh, types of trolls, how you can spot the trolls, and a whole lot more. Now, did you, anybody notice, this just came up on my, I guess my home page on YouTube. Creators ask the experts, COVID-19 and vaccines. Wow. Okay. All of the, um, what are they called? Social media influencers, I guess, are posting the, the vaccine. See, I have to edit what I was just naturally going to say. Now I have to edit what I say. But as you can see, you know, here, this social media influencer, Asante, the artist. And I just, I looked at their channels and it was very, it was really very interesting. Um, 77,000 views, but I took this capture a while ago. And here's her channel. 77,000 views, but then when I captured her channel, 166,000. But on her videos, as you can see, you know, here she got four, close to 5,000, but it's usually around... Um, in between one and two thousand, but when she when she is posting as a social media influencer on a subject matter that's near and dear to our heart, she gets an awful lot of views. Paid social media influencers that is part of the war now, unfortunately. Yeah, not too long ago, you could have gotten this document easy just by putting in the title. You can't now. Yeah, you know, the the uh, what I've been coming up with is just these summaries or abstracts, and well, if you want to see the document, you've got to pay. Uh, but I did find it today. Social media as a tool. It's, uh, you can still read it. If you click on the link, you can still download it. I downloaded this document a long time ago. And I can't, I can't post a link except to this version which, you know, you can do the full screen. And um, I don't see anywhere where you can uh, zoom in, but you can still read the document. It's still, you still have access to it. And it's eye-opening. NATO, the information war that Hillary was talking about, it's very real. And 
you know, this war on free speech, this war um, to literally uh, delete the truth from the Internet, it's only getting more and more intense. And it's, it's difficult to, um, to deal with. I find it difficult. As an American growing up in this country, living in this country, now facing everything that we are facing, it's clear we are at war. It's an uh, unconventional war. And again, I'll say this. I've said it so many times. If they were dropping bombs, Americans would unite. They would unite. They would stand together. And they would fight the enemy. Unfortunately, the bombs are not dropping. Instead, they're using, oh, uh, you know, they, they have a whole host of uh, weapons, weather, information, um, and using private companies as a front to extinguish the First Amendment, free speech. So I will link below to this version of it now. <clears throat> when you, and I posted videos on Kafka Winston World about this NATO social hybrid war, social media as a tool for the hybrid war. So having read the document, and then I come across this, Facebook hires NATO press officer Ben Nemo as intelligence chief. Social media platforms hiring not only NATO press officer, but they're also in, there's so many intelligence officers in all these platforms, in Google and YouTube. Um, so it's on, as they say. The war is on. All right, so consider this a part two to the video that I just posted right before this one on all of the censorship that is taking place. The CIA uh, arm in arm with social media, with Google, with a whole lot of quote unquote private companies that are spying on all of us. And now, the military origins of Facebook. Facebook's growing role in the ever-expanding surveillance and pre-crime apparatus of the national security state demands new scrutiny of the company's origins and its products as they relate to a former controversial DARPA-run surveillance program that was essentially analogous to what is currently the world's largest social network. And DARPA called it Life Log. So, are they really private entities? No. All right, this is a long article. I'm going to read it. I think the details are very interesting. Many might find it boring, but I want to document it. Daniel Baker, mid-February. Daniel Baker, a U.S. veteran described by the media as anti-Trump, anti-government, and white supremacist, and anti-police, was charged by a Florida grand jury with two counts of transmitting a communication in interstate commerce containing a threat to kidnap or injure. The communication in question had been posted by Baker on Facebook, where he had created an event page to organize an armed counter-rally to one planned by Trump supporters at the Florida capital of Tallahassee on January 6. If you are afraid to die fighting the enemy, then stay in bed and live. Call all of your friends and rise up. 
Baker's case is notable as it is one of the first pre-crime arrests based entirely on social media posts. The local, uh, the logical conclusion, I'm sorry, I, suddenly my brain was kind of working overtime and I'm not sure if it's the first, but the logical conclusion of the Trump administration's and now Biden administration's push to normalize arresting individuals for online posts to prevent violent acts before they can happen. From the increasing sophistication of U.S. intelligence military contractor Palantir, uh, founder of Palantir, co-founder of PayPal, same Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel, uh, Donald Trump's very good friend. Palantir's predictive pol um, policing programs to the formal announcement of the Justice Department's disruption and early engagement program in 2019 to Biden's first budget, which contains $111 million for pursuing and managing increasing domestic terrorism caseloads. The steady advance toward a pre-crime-centered war on domestic terror, as has, has been notable under every post-9-11 presidential administration, every one of them. No one stopped it. It only got worse. And if you've been following the news, you know the Department of Homeland Security, Department of Justice, oh, they're all, we've got to fight those domestic terrorists, a.k.a. Trump supporters, right-wingers, conservatives. And when Americans are reading this, I, 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 what, what, how are they processing this information, or are they processing the information? Okay, part one of this two-part series on Facebook and the U.S. national security state explores the social media network's origins and the timing and nature of its rise as it relates to a controversial military program that was shut down the same day that Facebook launched LifeLog. It was one of several controversial post-9-11 surveillance programs pursued by the Pentagon's Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, that threatened to destroy privacy and civil liberties in the United States while also seeking to harvest data for producing humanized artificial intelligence, DARPA's data mining for national security, and to humanize artificial intelligence, DARPA, in close collaboration with the United States intelligence community, specifically the CIA, began developing a pre-crime approach to combating terrorism known as Total Information Awareness, or TIA. The purpose of TIA was to develop an all-seeing military surveillance apparatus. The official logic behind TIA was that Invasive surveillance of the entire U.S. population was necessary to prevent terrorist attacks, bioterrorism events, and event, um, even naturally occurring disease outbreaks. The architect of TIA and the man who led it during its relatively brief existence was John Poindexter. And you know, when you read articles like this or you do research, you find out, huh, Republicans and Democrats seem to be on the same page. Um, so John, John Poindexter, best known for being Ronald Reagan's national security advisor during the Iran-Contra affair and for being convicted of five felonies in relation to that scandal, a less well-known activity of Iran-Contra figures like Poindexter and Oliver North was their development of the main core database 
to be used in continuity of government. Protocols. Main Corps was used to compile a list of U.S. dissidents and potential troublemakers to be dealt with if the continuity of government protocols were ever invoked. They have that list. I sure as hell am on it. A whole lot of us are on it. And yes, you know, what's happening now in the United States is what happened in East Germany, the Stasi, Soviet Union, Mao's China. These protocols could be invoked for a variety of reasons, including widespread public opposition to a U.S. military invention abroad, widespread internal dissent, or a vaguely defined moment of national crisis, or time of panic. We might face that time of panic this summer uh, with um, the possibility of the world economic forums, what is it called, cyber polygon simulation, where the internet, uh, it's hacked. There's a virus going through and it's infecting all devices. And suddenly, you have no electricity. You have no internet. You have, but you've got a lot of angry Americans. Oh, and the rising prices of everything. And, and the destruction of millions upon millions upon millions of Americans' livelihood. And it could be a wild summer. Americans were not informed if their name was placed on the list, and a person could be added to the list for merely having attended a protest in the past, for failing to pay taxes, or for other often trivial behaviors deemed unfriendly, unfriendly by its architects in the Reagan administration. Yeah. New York Times columnist William Sapphire and this was a while ago, in a op-ed remarked, Poindexter is now realizing his 20-year dream, getting the data mining power to snoop on every public and private act of every American. This, this the snooping, the spying on Americans, this was going on prior to 9-11. TIA program met with considerable citizen outrage after it was revealed to the public in early 2003. TIA's critics included the American Civil Liberties Union, which claimed that the surveillance effort would kill privacy in America because every aspect of our lives would be cataloged. While several mainstream media outlets warned that Total information awareness was fighting terror by terrifying U.S. citizens. As a result of the pressure, DARPA changed the program's name to Terrorist Information Awareness and then changed the propaganda regarding the program and said, okay, it's a program aiming specifically at terrorists. TIA projects were not actually closed down. They don't ever close anything down. Do you think for one moment our Pentagon, CIA, would let go of programs like this? No. They change names and they go black into another agency. They divert funding this has been going on forever. TIA projects were not actually closed down. However, with most move to the classified portfolios of the Pentagon and the U.S. intelligence community, some became intelligence-funded and guided private sector endeavors, such as Peter Thiel's Palantir. Yes, we'll use private contractors 
That way we can escape any kind of oversight. Soon after TIA was initiated, a similar DARPA program was taking shape under the direction of a close friend of Poindexter's DARPA program manager, Douglas Cage. Cage's project, Life Log, sought to build a database tracking a person's entire existence. That included an individual's relationships and communications, phone calls, mail, etc., their media consumption, their purchases, and much more, in order to build a digital record of everything an individual says, sees, or does. What I just read was in quotations from LifeLog. It would create a permanent and searchable electronic diary of a person's entire life. The information that LifeLog gleaned from an individual's every interaction with technology would be combined with information obtained from a GPS transmitter that tracked and documented the person's location, audiovisual sensors that recorded what the person saw and said, as well as biomedical monitors that gauged the person's health. Like TIA, LifeLog was promoted by DARPA as potentially supporting medical research and the early detection of an emerging epidemic. And of course, that's what they put out to the public. Critics in mainstream media outlets and elsewhere were quick to point out that the program would inevitably be used to build profiles on dissidents as well as suspected terrorists, combined with TIA's surveillance of individuals at multiple levels, LifeLog went farther by, quote, adding physical information like how we feel, our emotions, and media data like what we read to this transactional data. Lee Tian of the Electronic Frontier Foundation warned at the time that the programs that DARPA was pursuing, including LifeLog, quote, have obviously easy paths to Homeland Security deployments, unquote. LifeLog had another goal, the humanization uh, and advancement of artificial intelligence. In late 2002, just months prior to announcing the existence of LifeLog, DARPA released a strategy document detailing development of artificial intelligence by feeding it with massive floods of data from various sources. The post-9-11 military surveillance projects like LifeLog and TIA being only two of them offered quantities of data that had previously been unthinkable to obtain and that could potentially hold the key to achieving the hypothesized technological singularity. The 2002 DARPA document even discusses DARPA's effort to create a brain-machine interface that would feed human thoughts directly into machines to advance artificial intelligence by keeping it constantly awash in freshly mined data. The whole point of Facebook, the whole point of Google buying YouTube, the whole point of Twitter and Instagram, collect all the data on everyone. Researchers for the LifeLog project um, Howard Schraub at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. Um, well, some of these people, 
like the Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT, was intimately connected with the 1980s corporation and DARPA contractor called Thinking Machines, which was founded by and or employed many of the lab's luminaries, Danny Hillis, Marvin Minsky, Eric Lander, all close associates of and or sponsored by intelligence-linked pedophile Jeffrey Epstein, who also generously donated to MIT as an institution and was a leading funder of and advocate for transhumanist-related scientific research. Uh, this very um, sick, twisted, psychopathic group, they all seem to be connected. Soon after the LifeLog program was shuttered, critics worried that, like the Total Information Awareness program, it would continue under a different name. Facebook. MIT's David Garger, Garger was also certain that the DARPA project would continue in repackaged form. He told Wired that, quote, I am sure such research will continue to be funded under some other title. I can't imagine DARPA dropping out of such a key research area. Facebook. Feel information awareness. In late 2003, total information awareness was shut down, ostensibly, and defunded by Congress. Just months after it was launched, it was only later revealed that total information awareness was never actually shut down, with its various programs having been covertly divided up among the web of military and intelligence agencies that make up the U.S. national security state. And some of it was privatized. Peter Thiel incorporated Palantir. Palantir. Soon after Palantir's incorporation in 2003, Richard Pearl. Oh, these names. <sighs> we have to be reminded, right? You know, the Bush administration. Okay, a notori uh, Richard Pearl, a notorious neoconservative for, for the, uh, or from the Reagan and Bush administrations and an architect of the Iraq War, called Total Information Awareness's Poindexter, actually called him, um, and said he wanted to introduce him to Thiel and his associate Alex Karp now Palantir CEO. Thiel and Karp sought to pick the brain of the man, now widely viewed as the godfather of modern surveillance. Soon after Palantir's incorporation, the CIA's in Qtel became the company's first backer, aside from Thiel himself giving it an estimated $2 million dollars. Incutel's stake in Palantir would not be public re publicly reported until mid-2006. The real value of the Incutel investment was that it gave Palantir access to the CIA analysts who were its intended clients. Alex Karp told the New York Times in 2020, October. A key figure in the making of Incutel investments during this period, including the investment in Palantir, was the CIA's chief information officer, Alan Wade, who had been the intelligence community's point man for total information awareness. Wade had previously co-founded the post-9-11 Homeland Security software contractor, um, Gilead, or Chiliad alongside none other than Christine Maxwell. Huh. 
sister of Gis, um, Ghislaine Maxwell. Not even sure if I'm pronouncing her name correctly. I have not been into the Epstein Maxwell crap. Hardly crap, though, considering all of their victims. And the daughter of Iran-Contra figure, intelligence operative, and media baron Robert Maxwell. The CIA would be Palantir's only client until 2008. During that period, Palantir's two top engineers, Aki Jayan and Stephen Cohen, traveled to CIA headquarters at Langley, Virginia, every two weeks, and uh, Jane, I, I'm not even sure how, uh, look, forget my pronouncing names. I don't know what's wrong with my brain, but it's always been like this <laughs> with names for some reason. Okay, it, Jane recalls making at least 200 trips to CIA headquarters between 2005 and 2009. During those regular visits, CIA analysts, quote, would test Palantir software out and offer feedback, and then Cohen and Jane would fly back to California to tweak it. Today's, today, Palantir's products are used for mass surveillance, predictive policing, and other disconcerting policies of the U.S. national security state. A telling example is Palantir's sizable involvement in the new Health and Human Services run wastewater surveillance program that is quietly spreading across the United States. As noted in a previous unlimited hangout, which is this site, in their report, that system is the resurrection of a total information awareness program called biosurveillance. It is feeding all its data into the Palantir Managed and Secretive Health and Human Service Project or uh, Protect Data Platform. Sorry. The decision to turn controversial DARPA led programs into a private venture or private venturers, however, was not limited to Thiel's Palantir. The rise of Facebook. In the wake of public outrage over DARPA's post-9-11 programs, yeah, they ostensibly dismantled those programs. One of these programs was LifeLog, and many of the same vocal critics who had attacked TIA went after LifeLog with similar zeal. With Stephen Aftergood of the Federation of American Scientists telling Wired at the time that, quote, LifeLog has the potential to become something like total information awareness cubed, cubed, even worse than the recently canceled TIA. They don't cancel them. So LifeLog, huh? It was publicly nixed on February 4, 2004. Fortuitously, fortuitously, I am tired, I'm sorry. Fortuitously, for those supporting the goals and ambitions of LifeLog, a company that turned out to be its private sector analog was born on the exact same day. What is now the world's largest social network, Facebook, launched its website and quickly rose to the top of the social media roost, leaving other social media companies of the era in the dust. Boy, that Zuckerberg is just such a genius, isn't he? It's lifelog. Zuckerberg, Facebook, a front. It's a front for DARPA, DARPA's life log. 
Facebook co-founders Mark Zuckerberg and Dustin um, Moskowitz brought Sean Parker onto Facebook's executive team. Parker, previously known for co-founding Napster, later connected Facebook with its first outside investor. Ooh, none other than Peter Thiel. Thiel, at that time, in coordination with the CIA, was actively trying to resurrect controversial DARPA programs that had been dismantled the previous year. Notably, Sean Parker, who became Facebook's first president, also had a history with the CIA, which recruited him at the age of 16, soon after he had been busted by the FBI for hacking corporate and military databases. They get the best and the brightest. Thanks to Parker, in September 2004, Thiel formally acquired half a million worth of Facebook shares and was added, added to its board. Parker maintained close ties to Facebook as well as to Thiel, with Parker being hired as a managing partner of Thiel's Founders Fund in 2006. Thiel's long-standing symbiotic relationship with Facebook co-founders extends to his company Palantir, as the data that Facebook users make public invariably winds up in Palantir's databases and helps drive the surveillance engine Palantir runs for a handful of U.S. police departments, the military, and the intelligence community. In the case of the Facebook Cambridge Analytical Analytica data scandal, Palantir was also involved in utilizing Facebook data to benefit the 2016 Donald Trump presidential campaign. Today, as recent arrests, arrests such as that of Daniel Baker, who uh, who indicated on Facebook what he was going to be doing. Uh, Facebook data is slated to help power the coming war on domestic terror. Given that information shared on the platform is being used in pre-crime capture of U.S. citizens domestically. Now, could a whole lot of us be Daniel Baker? Yes. And when the time comes, we will be. In light of this, it is worth dwelling on the point that Thiel's exertions to resurrect the main aspects of total information awareness as his own private company coincided with his becoming the first outside investor in what was essentially the analog of another of another DARPA program deeply intertwined with total information awareness. Facebook a front. The coincidence that Facebook launched the same day that LifeLog was shut down? Because of that, there has been recent speculation that Zuckerberg began and launched the project with Moskowitz, Severin, and others through some sort of behind-the-scenes coordination with DARPA and another organ of the national security state. Now, years ago, myself and others were posting on information that we all got through our research that these social media giants were essentially funded. Well, InQtel is a big funding of these startups. Our government funded Google and Facebook. So, and they want the military especially. They fund these private contractors 
or these um, brilliant computer whizzes at universities, colleges, they fund these people to create what they want, what the CIA wants, the kind of software, the kind of platforms, the kind of projects that they want. And those who are developing these programs go back and forth. They have visits from the uh, government officials in the military, in, in the CIA, in intelligence agencies, tweaking, tweaking these programs until they're launched. These are not private companies. Okay. They're destroying our free speech because so many people say, well, they're private companies and they can do what they want. No. And first of all, they would have been broken up. Years, decades ago, we used to break up monopolies. Google is a monopoly over information, and we haven't broken that up. Why? Because it's not a private company. So they have the fronts. Uh, they're called private companies, and they are doing what our government can't because of that constitution. Well, you just get a private company to do it for you. An important point linking Facebook and LifeLog is the subsequent identification of Facebook with LifeLog by the latter's DARPA architect himself. In 2015, um, Cage told Vice that, quote, Facebook is the real face of pseudo lifelog at this point. We have ended up providing the same kind of detailed personal information to advertisers and data brokers and without arousing the kind of opposition that LifeLog provoked. Get it? LifeLog didn't end. They just changed the name to Facebook. Users of Facebook and other large social media platforms have so far been content to allow these platforms to sell their private data so long as they publicly operate as private enterprises. Backlash only really emerged when such activities were publicly tied to the U.S. government and essentially the U.S. military, even though Facebook and other tech giants routinely share their users' data with the national security state. There is little difference between public and private entities in practice. Edward Snowden, the NSA whistleblower, notably warned in 2019 that Facebook is just as untrustworthy as U.S. intelligence, but Facebook is U.S. intelligence. He stated, quote, Facebook's internal purpose, whether they state it publicly or not, is to compile perfect records of private lives to the maximum extent of their capability and then exploit that for their own corporate enrichment. Damn the consequences. The more Google knows about you, the more Facebook knows about you, the more they are able to create permanent records of private lives, your private life, the more influence and power they have over you and all of us. This underscores how both Facebook and intelligence-linked Google have accomplished much of what LifeLog aimed to do, but on a much larger scale than what DARPA had originally envisioned. The reality is that most of the large Silicon Valley companies of today have been closely linked 
to the U.S. national security state establishment since their inception. Notable examples aside from Facebook and Palantir include Google and Oracle. And you can click on the hyperlinks where there's this white line to find out more information. Today, these companies are more openly collaborating with the military intelligence agencies that guided their development and or provided early funding as they are used to provide the data needed to fuel the newly announced war on domestic terror and its accompanying algorithms. Hardly a coincidence that someone like Peter Thiel, who built Palantir with the CIA and helped ensure Facebook's rise, is also heavily involved in big data, artificial intelligence-driven, predictive policing approaches to surveillance and law enforcement, both through Palantir and through his other investments. Total information awareness, LifeLog, and related government and private programs and institutions launched after 9-11 were always intended to be used against the American public in war against dissent. This was noted by their critics in 2003 and 4, and by those who have examined the origins of the Homeland Security pivot in the United States and their pivot from looking overseas, oh, let's just pivot right back home, Homeland Security, and its connection to past CIA counterterror programs in Vietnam, Latin America, the illusion of Facebook and related companies as being independent of the U.S. national security state has prevented a recognition of the reality of social media platforms and their long-intended yet covert uses, which we are beginning to see move into the open following the events of January 6. That insurrection, quote-unquote, now with billions of people conditioned to use Facebook and social media as part of their daily lives, the question becomes, if that illusion were to be irrevocably shattered today, would it make a difference to Facebook users? I don't think it would. Would it make a difference if people understood that Facebook is not a private company? Would people rise up considering its literal um, elimination of free speech? Or has the populace become so conditioned to surrendering their private data in exchange for dopamine-fueled social validation loops that it no longer matters who ends up holding that data? doesn't matter. It's obvious. So, I will link below to this article. You might want to bookmark this site, unlimitedhangout.com, for part two of their series on Facebook. And they will explore how the social media platform has grown into a behemoth that is much more extensive than what LifeLog's program managers had originally invested, uh, envisioned in concert with military contractors and former heads of DARPA, Facebook has spent the last several years doing two key things, preparing to play a much larger role in surveillance and data mining than it currently does, and advancing the development of a humanized artificial intelligence major objective of LifeLog. This is really important information. Very important information. Every administration has been pursuing the same domestic policy uh, as well as foreign policy. Nothing changes at all. Everything gets worse. 
January 6th and the lies afterwards, the lies of mainstream media about what took place at the Capitol, the incessant you know, get rid of these right-wing extremists, Trump supporters, Joe Biden saying, I don't know if there will be a Republican Party. I may not have to run again. That's essentially what he meant. Nothing seems to alarm Americans as long as they're comfortable and they got, they got their streaming on their screens and whatever they do here. That's all they care about. We're going down fast. And the elimination of free speech, that'll be it. And once you lose your liberty, oh, it's kind of like you betray trust, good luck getting it back. Good luck getting liberty back at this point. 